Welcome back. Happy Wednesday. We have two more days of school, so I hope you enjoy it as much as I am. I am loving reading this book, but as a fair warning, today we have a little bit more sad things happen in our chapter, and then I will read a, a happier chapter. So chapter eight. Um, it starts off right where we left off Monday, and I want you to think about it in your head before I remind you what happened. Hopefully you're remembering, um, of course, there was the big battle, the Aleuts left, um, time had passed, a ship came to take all of the tribal people, Rama was left behind, Karana's little brother, so she jumped off the ship and swam back to him, and um, that is where we are. So they are alone on this island. Chapter 8. The wind blew strong as we climbed the trail, covering the mesa with sand that sifted around our legs and shut out the sky. Since it was not possible to find our way back, we took shelter among some rocks. We stayed there until night fell. Then the wind lessened and the moon came out, and by its light we reached the village. The huts looked like ghosts in the cold light. As we neared them, I heard a strange sound, like that of running feet. I thought that it was a sound made by the wind, but when we came closer, I saw dozens of wild dogs scurrying around through the huts. They ran from us, snarling as they went. The pack must have slunk into the village soon after we left, for it had gorged itself upon the abalone that had not been taken. It had gone everywhere searching out food, and Ramo and I had to look hard to find enough for our supper. While we ate beside a small fire, I could hear the dogs on the hill not far away, and though the night their howls came to me on the and through the night their howls came to me on the wind. But when the sun rose and I went out of the hut, the pack trotted off toward its lair which was at the north side of the island, in a large cave. That day we spent gathering food. The wind blew and the waves crashed against the shore so that we could not go out on the rocks. I gathered gall legs on the cliff, and Ramo speared a string of small fish in one of the tide pools. He brought them home, walking proudly with the string over his back. He felt, in his way, that he'd made up for the trouble he had caused. With the seeds I'd gathered in the ravine, we had a plentiful meal although I had to cook it on a flat rock. My bowls were at the bottom of the sea. The wild dogs came again that night. Drawn by the scent of fish, they sat on the hill, barking and growling at each other. I could see the light from the fire shining in their eyes. At dawn, they left. The ocean was calm on this day, and we were able to hunt abalone among the rocks. From seaweed, we wove a rough basket, which we filled before the sun was overhead. On the way home, carrying the abalone between us, Ramo and I stopped on the cliff. The air was clear and we could look far out to sea in the direction the ship had gone. Will it come back today? Ramo asked. It may, I answered him, though I did not think so. More likely it will come after many suns, for the country where it has gone is far off. Ramo looked up at me, his black eyes shone. I do not care if the ship never comes, he said. Why do you say this? I asked him. Ramla thought, making a hole in the earth with the point of his spear. Why? I asked again. Because I like it here with you, he said. It is more fun than when the others were here. Tomorrow I am going to where the canoes are hidden and bring one back to Coral Cove. We will use it to fish in and to go looking around the island. They are too heavy for you to put into the water. You will see. Ramla threw out his chest. Around his neck was a string of sea elephant teeth, which someone had left behind. It was much too large for him, and the teeth were broken, but they rattled as he thrust the spear down between us. You forget that I am the son of Cowig, he said. Remember, Cowig was their dad, the chief. I do not forget, I answered, but you are a small son. Someday you will be tall and strong, and then you will be able to handle a big canoe. I am the son of Chowig, he said again. And as he spoke, his eyes suddenly grew large. I am his son, and since he is dead, I have taken his place. I am now chief of Galasset. All my wishes must be obeyed. But first you must become a man, as is the custom. Therefore, I will have to whip you with a switch of nettles and then tie you to a red anthill. Ramo grew pale. He had seen the rights of manhood given in our tribe and remembered them. Quickly, I said. Since there are no men to give the rights, perhaps you will not have to undergo the nettles and the ants, Chief Ramo. I do not know if this name suits me, he said, smiling. He tossed his spear at a passing gall. I will think of something better. 
I watched him stride off to get the spear, a little boy with thin arms and legs like sticks, wearing a big string of sea elephant teeth. Now that he had become chief of Golosset, I would have even more trouble with him. But I wanted to run after him and take him in my arms. I have thought of a name, he said when he came back. What is it? I asked solemnly. Okay, I'll do my best with this. I am Chief Tanyo Sitlopai. That is very long and hard to say. You will soon learn, Chief Tanyo Sitlopai said. I had no thought of letting Chief Tanyo Sitlope go along to the place where the canoes were hidden. But the next morning when I awoke, I found that Rama was not in the hut. He was not outside either, and I knew that he had gotten up in the dark and left by himself. I was frightened. I thought of all that might befall him. He had climbed down the kelp rope once before, but he would have trouble pushing even the smallest of the canoes off the rocks. And if he did get one afloat without hurting himself, would he be able to paddle around the sand spit where the tides ran fast? Thinking of these dangers, I started off to overtake him. I had not gone far along the trail before I began to wonder if I should not let him go to the cliff by himself. There was no way of telling when the ship would come back for us. Until it did, we were alone upon the island. Ramo, therefore, would have to become a man sooner than if we were not alone, since I would need his help in many ways. Suddenly, I turned around and took the trail toward Coral Cove. If Ramo could put the canoe in the water and get through the tides that raced around the sand spit, he would reach the harbor when the sun was tall in the sky. I would be waiting on the beach. For what was the fun of a voyage if no one was there to greet you? I put Ramo out of my mind as I stretched the rocks for mussels, or sorry, searched the rocks for mussels. I thought of the food we would need to gather and how best to protect it from the wild dogs when we were not in the village. I thought also of the ship. I tried to remember what Matasip had said to me. For the first time, I began to wonder if the ship would ever return. I wondered about this as I pried the shells off the rocks, and I would stop and look fearfully at the empty sea that stretched away farther than my eyes could reach. The sun moved higher. There was no sign of Ramo. I began to feel uneasy. The basket was filled and I carried it up to the mesa. From here, I looked down on the harbor and further on along the coast to the spit that thrust out like a fish hook into the ocean. I could see the small waves sliding up the sand and beyond them, a curving line of foam where the currents raced. I waited on the mesa until the sun was overhead. And then I hurried back to the village, hoping that Ramo might have come back while I was gone. The hut was empty. Quickly, I dug a hole for the shellfish, rolled a heavy stone over the opening to protect them from the wild dogs, and started off toward the path to the south part of the island. Two trails led there, one on each side of a long sand dune. Ramo was not on the trail I, had, I was traveling, and thinking that he might come back out of sight along the other one, I called to him as I ran. I heard no answer, but I did hear far off the barking of dogs. The barking grew louder as I came closer to the cliff. It would die away and after a short silence, start up again. The sound came from the opposite side of the dunes and leaving the trail, I climbed upward through the sand to its top. A short distance beyond the dune near the cliff, I saw the pack of wild dogs. There were many of them and they were moving around in a circle. In the middle of the circle was Ramo. He was lying on his back and had a deep wound in his throat. He lay very still. When I picked him up, I knew he was dead. There were other wounds on his body from the teeth of the wild dogs. He had been dead a long time, and from his footsteps on the earth, I could see that he had never reached the cliff. Two dogs lay on the ground not far from him, and then the side of one of them was his broken spear. I carried Ramo back to the village, reaching it when the sun was far down. The dogs followed me all the way, but when I laid him down in the hut and came out with a club in my hand, they trotted off to a low hill. A big gray dog with long curling hair and yellow eyes was their leader, and he went last. It was growing dark, but I followed them up the hill. Slowly, they retreated in front of me, not making a sound. I followed them across two hills in a small valley to a third hill, whose face was a ledge of rock. On one end of the ledge was a cave. One by one, the dogs went into it. The mouth of the cave was too wide and high to fill with rocks. I gathered brush and made a fire, thinking that I would push it back into the cave. Through the night, I would feed it and push it farther and farther back, but there was not enough brush for this. 
When the moon rose, I left the cave and went off through the valley and over the three hills to my home. All night I sat there with the body of my brother and did not sleep. I vowed that someday I would go back and kill the wild dogs in that cave. I would kill all of them. I thought of how I would do it, but mostly I thought of Ramo, my brother. So let's pause and take a moment to think about how you would feel if you were in this situation. What do you think would be the hardest part for you? If you were alone, we'd obviously be lonely. Um, food becomes an issue. Staying warm, finding enough water. Um, but maybe foremost on your mind would be the fact that these wild dogs are a danger to you. Um, so more than just revenge for your brother, think about how scared you may be for the wild dogs to bother you. And we will try to get one more chapter done. Chapter 9. I do not remember much of this time, except that many suns rose and set. I thought about what I was going to do now that I was alone. I did not leave the village. Not until I had eaten all of the abalones did I leave, and then only to gather more. Yet I do remember the day that I decided I would never live in the village again. It was a morning of thick fog and the sound of far-off waves breaking on the shore. I had never noticed how silent the village was. Fog crept in and out of the empty huts. It made shapes as it drifted, and they reminded me of all the people who were dead and those who were gone. The noise of the surf seemed to be their voices speaking. I sat for a long time, seeing these shapes and hearing the voices, until the sun came out and the fog vanished. Then I made a fire against the wall of the house. When it was burned to the earth, I started a fire in another house. Thus, one by one, I destroyed them all, so that there were only ashes left to mark the village of Glosset. So... Maybe not what you would have thought to have done, but I want you to think, why would she have wanted to destroy her village? And as always, I wish I could call on you and hear your wonderful responses. There was nothing to take away with me except a basket of food. I therefore traveled fast, and before night fell, I reached the place where I had decided to live until the ship returned. This place lay on a, tri on a headland a half league to the west of Coral Cove. There was a large rock on that headland and two stunted trees. Behind the rock was a clear place about 10 steps across, which was sheltered from the wind, from which I could see the harbor and the ocean. A spring of water flowed from a ravine nearby. That night I climbed onto the rock to sleep. It was flat on top and wide enough for me to stretch out. Also, it was so high from the ground that I did not need to fear the wild dogs while I was sleeping. I had not seen them again since the day they had killed Ramo, but I was sure they would soon come to my new camp. The rock was also a safe place to store the food I had brought with me and everything I should gather. Since it was still winter and any day the ship might return, there was no use to store food I would not need. This gave me time to make weapons to protect myself from the dogs, which I felt would sometime attack me to kill them all one by one. I had a club I found in one of the huts, but I needed a bow and arrows and a large spear. The spear which I had taken from the slain dog was too small. It was good for spearing fish and little else. The laws of Galasset forbade the making of weapons by women of the tribe. So I went out to search for any that might have been left behind. I went first to where the village had been and sifted the ashes for spearheads, and then finding none to the place where the canoes were hidden believing that weapons might, might have been stored there with the food and water. I found nothing in the canoes under the cliff. Then remembering the chest of Aleuts, the chest the Aleuts had brought to the shore, I set out for Coral Cove. I had seen the chest on the beach during the battle, but did not remember that the hunters had taken it with them when they fled. The beach was empty except for rows of seaweed washed in by the storm. The tide was out and I looked at the place where the chest had lain. It was just below the ledge Ulape and I had stood on while we watched the battle. The sand was smooth, and I dug many small holes with a stick. I dug in a wide circle, thinking that the storm might have covered it with sand. Near the center of the circle, the stick hit something hard, which I was sure was a rock. But as I dug deeper with my hands, I saw it was the black lid of the chest. All morning I worked, moving the sand away, until the chest lay deep from the washing of the waves, and I did not try to dig it out but only so I could raise the lid. As the sun rose high, the tide came rushing up the beach and filled the hole with sand. Each wave covered the chest deeper until it was completely hidden. I stood on the place, bracing myself against the waves so that I would not have to look for it again. 
When the tide turned, I began to dig with my feet, working them down and down, and then with my hands. The chest was filled with beads and bracelets and earrings of many colors. I forgot about the spearheads I'd come for. I held each of the trinkets to the sun, turning them so that they caught the light. I put on the longest string of beads, which were blue, and a pair of blue bracelets, which exactly fitted my wrists, and walked down the shore admiring myself. I walked the whole length of the cove. The beads and the bracelets made tinkling sounds. I felt like the bride as a chief. I felt like the bride of a chief as I walked there by the waves. That noise is construction. They're here working again. We'll wait a moment. Sorry, I don't, I don't know if it's loud on your end. It's loud on my end. I'll try to read up here close. I came to the foot of the trail where the battle had been fought. Suddenly, I remembered those who had died there and the men who had brought the jewels I was wearing. I went back to the chest. For a long time, I stood beside it, looking at the bracelets and the beads hanging from my neck, so beautiful and bright in the sun. They do not belong to the Aleuts, I said. They belong to me. But even as I said this, I knew that I could never wear them. One by one, I took them off. I also took the rest of the beads from the chest. Then I walked through the waves and flung them all far away, out into the deep water. There were no iron spearheads in the chest. I closed the lid and covered it with sand. I looked along the bottom of the trail, but finding nothing there that I could use, I gave up on my search. For many days, I did not think of the weapons again, not until the wild dogs came one night and sat under the rock and howled. They were gone at daylight, but not far. During the day, I could see them slinking through the brush, watching me. That night, they came back to the headland. I had buried what was left of my supper, but they dug it up, snarling and fighting among themselves over the scraps. Then they began to pace back and forth at the foot of the rock, sniffing the air, for they could smell my tracks and knew that I was somewhere near. All right, we are going to stop there. We're not quite to the end of the chapter, but it's rather long. So when we come back on Friday, which is our last day of school, we will read the final uh, end of that chapter. But I will continue to read this book over the summer. So uh, I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday, and I will uh, hopefully see you all in our Google chat at 1030. At, not at 1030, at 4. <laughs>